I think one way that I'd like to try to draw out some of your thinking is to turn to some of your specific empirical historical work. Sure. And um, I know that your most recent book, The Devil's Handwriting, mm -hmm. has gotten a huge amount of attention and mm -hmm. celebrated prizes and, mm -hmm. and so forth. And um, I, I guess I'd like to ask you to talk a little bit about the, it is both historically specific and it's also comparative. So mm -hmm. maybe you could just kind of describe the method, yeah. describe the knowledge. Sure. Um, well, first let me just say one or two sentences about what the book is. It's it's an attempt to evaluate a thesis associated with post-colonial theory on the first in the first swipe, which um, in a famous formulation by Edward Said in his book Orientalism suggested that colonialism grew out of a, a set of discourses, um, orientalist discourses or ethnographic, broadly ethnological or anthropological mm -hmm. discourses, or as he put it in a famous and very citable quote, from travelers' tales, colonies were created. So I decided in the first uh, step of this book to sort of evaluate that hypothesis. To what extent were actual colonial overseas practices of a European power, in this case, Imperial Germany in the late 19th century and early 20th century, to what extent were these actual policies, these native policies, implemented in places as far flung as Africa, Qingdao, China, and Samoa in Polynesia or in the Pacific, actually driven by pre-colonial travelers' tales and the ethnographic images of the populations that were colonized? To what extent did colonial practices flow directly from discourses, in other words? And this is, in a broader sense, an attempt to evaluate what has come to be seen as a kind of a cultural or idealistic turn within the social sciences, one that, starting with Foucault, began to look at discourses as uh, primary to, I guess you could call them practices, in a very mm -hmm. crude sense. And so in Discipline and Punish, for example, Foucault looks at the development of discourses on discipline and penality and, and so on in the works of Jeremy Bentham and others and how they then are put into practice in a variety of carceral, carceral um, and penal institutions like the prison. And um, this gave rise then to Said's book on Orientalism, which made a similar claim about discourses about the, the, the non-Western other being at the core, at the origin of the actual colonial practices that were later on in history uh, implemented and uh, laid down upon those now colonized others. So in the first part of the book, I attempted to evaluate that, and I did that by reconstructing ethnographic discourses about Southern Africans, Polynesians, and China in European discourse and more specifically in German discourse leading up to the, the, the eve of colonization in the late 19th century. And when colonization then went into practice, uh, in other words, when these places like Southwest Africa, now known, nowadays Namibia, were conquered by the Europeans in the late 19th century, the colonizers did indeed bring with them, almost like a bag full of ideas, a set of texts and representations of the to-be-colonized Africans in this case. But the problem with the idealist explanation or the discourse-oriented approach, as I found, was, first of all, it was too monocausal. goes back to what I'd said earlier about the inherent complexity of social life and the openness of the social system, which means that most complicated social events are not derivable from a single mechanism. And secondly, um, from the kind of lack of a, sociolo a properly, I guess you could almost say sociological um, mediating mechanism in this case. And the mechanism that I more or less discovered was mediating the passage of these discourses into colonial practices was what I call following the sociologist Pierre Bourdieu, the field. And in this case, in speci it was a specific kind of a field. It was the field of the colonial state. And I argue in The Devil's Handwriting that the colonial state was a kind of a field in which colonial officials competed with one another, as is the case in any field where the actors compete, for a specific form of symbolic or cultural capital. And the specific form of symbolic capital that dominated or, or do ruled this domain was the supposed ability to understand and uh, make sense of the, the colonized other. And I call this ethnographic capital because it demanded from the colonizer um, a supposed ability to make sense of a radically foreign culture in ways that would then be turned into native policies, practice, practical politi political interventions 
uh, that could make sense of that. So that was the second stage, and that was in a sense a second mechanism then, the colonial state field. Mm -hmm. And then I moved directly into the interaction between colonizer and colonized. And when I studied that in a series of archival, in you know, mountains of archival documents that are left over from the German colonial empire, I found that in most of these cases, in the one in the on the ground interactions between colonizer and colonized, even though colonizers went in there with a certain approach and a certain ideological approach that was partly derived from their competition with other colonizers, the interaction with the colonized could often disrupt that. And it disrupted that in two main ways. The first was that colonizers often um, began to, the, the barrier between colonizer and colonized often began to break down in the practices of the colonizer. And there was a kind of a cross-identification with the colonized, a kind of an identification across this allegedly impermeable in, uh, barrier between an, an inferior colonized other and a superior colonizing um, uh, conqueror. And this set of cross-identifications was particularly strong in certain parts of the world where the images of the colonized among the colonizer, uh, even if uh, to some extent uh, denigrating or demeaning, for certain colonizers offered a kind of an imaginary promotion if they could imagine themselves as one of the colonized. And let me give you the most dramatic example in the case of China. In the late 19th century, Europe decided, or even starting in the middle of the 19th century with the British-driven opium wars, Britain and, the, and Europe tried to open up China to commerce and missionaries, and eventually in the late 19th century to actual colonies, starting, of course, with Hong Kong, and then in 1897 with the German colony in Qingdao, and then a whole series of others. When Europeans went to China, and even this is even true in the, in, in the earlier centuries with the Jesuits and other missionaries, many of them discovered a society that seemed to offer an imaginary resolution to their own class, social class uh, dilemmas back in Europe. Many of those from the educated middle classes in particular, but also people from lower social class positions in Europe, came upon China and thought they had found a society based on a, a kind of an educated meritocracy. And this educated meritocracy seemed preferable to this sort of either monarchical or oppressive societies and class stratified societies they lived in in Europe where class was mainly stratified by property and not by, not by meritocratically achieved educational attainment. So it became a kind of a fantasy realm for the projection of an alternative to Europe, one in which an educated, a university educated middle class person who had very little economic wealth could imagine that they actually would be able to rule that society if they were in the same position as the Chinese Mandarin elite. So that mechanism of cross-identification sometimes disrupted colonial plans and practices. And then a final mechanism that I look at in the book is the resistance or collaboration by the colonized themselves. Any regime of colonial policy required, at the very minimum, a kind of a passive, a kind of a, kind of a collaboration or a cooperation is perhaps a less loaded term by the colonized. A regime of native policy sets out a series of roles for the colonized. In the case of, say, Polynesian Samoa, a German colony at that time, the Samoans were configured within the dominant realm of native policy as um, actors who were to be re-traditionalized, turned back into sort of um, noble savages. And this required them to play certain roles in the native hier hierarchy that was set up by the colonial state. For that entire regime to work, the colonized had to agree to be, uh, to continue acting in a traditional way, even when they wanted to behave in a more westernized or Europeanized manner. And the Germans enforced this, as did other colonial po powers in case after case.